Welcome to April, everybody. It's no driving gloves. I guess, well, Der Jeffrey Hacker's uh, episode did come out on April 1st. It wasn't a joke. Very serious collector. And hopefully you found some of the interests he had beneficial and spent a little bit of time Googling some of the projects and checking out his website. Uh, Jeff, I think, is a pretty interesting guy. And like I said in the episode, he unfortunately, you learn all the way to your grave. I mean, he just seems to be fascinating and We'll have him back at some point, answer some of the listener questions, and he filled us in on a couple of his latest acquisitions that he couldn't talk about on the show after we finished recording last week. And while ugly, they are, um, uh, yep, I guess that's the way to say it. Everybody knows I like ugly, cool stuff, and so glad to hear the Pontiac Aztecs going back into production. But we were supposed to sit down, and we were going to have Will on tonight, and we were going to have Derek and uh, two guests from uh, local Birmingham car culture put together an event, and we were going to kind of discuss a little bit about their event. But what's interesting about them is they took over this event from another group, and they've done it correctly. They pay leases, pay insurance, they coordinate, they bring in sponsorship. Just a really nice, it's one of those monthly type car shows. But unfortunately, they had to cancel at the last minute because car shows reared their ugly heads. We'll see where that goes, but we should have them back on in the future when they get some of the logistics worked out. So we're going to put off the uh, how to organize a car show episode for a few weeks or a few months or till some other time. And Derek and I are here tonight. Will had to cancel because of the last minute rescheduling and that. And we're going to discuss something. I've, I'm going to take a little bit of this because under the Museum Code of Ethics, Derek's not allowed to speak about certain things. Uh, they still let him talk about too much. but. And we're going to discuss kind of the effect of an accident on a collector car. I mean, if I go out and I crash my SHO or my Transit Connect or something, and it's totaled, it goes to the junkyard, gets crushed. Or in Alabama and some other states, I think Kentucky falls into it, and I would assume Miss, Mississippi and that. These cars can be bought from a junkyard or bought from an auto auction, these salvage auctions, and rebranded with a salvage title or a rebuilt title, and they go back on the market. They're looked down upon. Their values are diminished. Heck, even if you just have an accident and do five thousand dollars worth of damage to your car, you have a diminished value on that, and that gets we'll get we'll get into that eventually on an appraisal episode. A value is taken away from that new car, and you know Derek and I are sitting around talking, and we go, "Isn't that what we do for a living when we restore cars? Uh, we literally pull a car out of a junkyard." Something that should never be saved. Something, you know, something we might have to cut a tree down that is growing out of it just to get the car out and rebuild it from scratch. And then it's great. And it's a wonderful car. Nobody thinks anything about that. It doesn't necessarily have a rebuilt title at that point or a salvage title. We go and we call up our local collector car insurance agency and we insure this thing for fifty, sixty, eighty thousand, a million dollars, whatever it ends up being worth, and then we drive it and then say, on, you know, unfortunately, maybe we have an accident. Maybe some guy spins out at a car show showing off and hits the side of it and does $30,000 worth of damage. Our collector car insurance company, or preferably the guy that hit us, collector car insurance company, pays. We spend $30,000. We get our car back. And you go... The, no value. It doesn't have a depreciated value. You know, if it's, say, my 65 Impala SS or 64 Impala SS and it gets damaged and it's worth $35,000 before the accident, it has an accident, $15,000 worth of damage, it all gets repaired, it's still worth $35,000. I do that with my 2017 Impala SS. I paid $40,000 for it. It has $25,000 worth of damage. It gets shuffled off to an auction. I get a check to pay me whatever book value is. And then if you have gap or whatever you need to maybe make you whole. 
you go away with your money. The car goes to a junkyard in, in Alabama. Some rebuilder comes along, buys it for five grand, spends a couple thousand dollars, fixes the car, and sells it. Is this a practice that we need to keep up, keep doing? Is this a practice that's thought of wrong? I really don't know. It's amazing. At what point do our cars go from being rebuilt salvage to uh, collect, uh, collector cars or an, you know, an item like that? And this is, of course, I guess, taking into account you have proper insurance and it's collector car insurance because any of the big people that advertise on TV, whether or not, you know, you know, a hippo sat on your car or your insurance agent magically appears or somebody dressed like a nurse comes and writes you a check or a lizard comes by, they're going to total, you know, your 64 Impala is worth book value, 1500 bucks if you don't have it properly insured. And hopefully we'll have an insurance guy on in the near future to help discuss some collector car values. Uh, those interviews are in the works too. Derek, after all my blabbering, do you want to jump in and take this down a road that you're safe to be on? And, uh, you know, I find it interesting because we, we look down at these rebuilt titles or these salvage titles, as you've already talked about. But in one way, I mean, this is a practice that is saving future classics and future antique cars and keeping them on the road right now to where they're not going to wind up in a junkyard rusting away, you know, rotting away and may have an impact on the future of restoration because they will be kind of kept up and, and not need to be pulled out of a junkyard, you know, and, and maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that's a bad thing. Yeah. We also kind of have to look at the idea of there's, there's other ways to look at this is what about significance of accidents? Are there, you know, historic implications for the future of whether or not an accident will make a car worth money, more money. Now, obviously you're going to have to have some foresight in that, um, you know, hindsight is always 2020 and we can talk about significant cars from the past that have had significant accidents that have led to them being worth more. Um, and that's kind of a, a balancing act there, but, you know, it, it, as we've said, it's, it's interesting. And I, I think there's multiple ways to look at this that can, kind of affect the value of the car, not only, you know, from your world, John, of uh, appraising cars and kind of buying, selling cars, things like that, but in the museum setting, what the historic value of that car might be. Is a car, you know, from my, from my setting, let's say, is a 1955 Corvette that has been in a wreck in the let's say 1960s and was in a junkyard pulled out and, and rebuilt in the 1980s is that from an you know historic standpoint educational standpoint or even a, a monetary value standpoint worth any less or any more than a you know 1955 corvette that hadn't been wrecked and right now the way the market, you know, the way the collector car world is and uh, in the museum, the historic value and setting of that car, if it was just a production car, I don't see any difference. Now, is that going to be the case for a modern vehicle, say a 2000, well, let's, you know, let's take like a 2017 Tesla or 2018 Tesla uh, that gets wrecked, goes to a junkyard and sits for 20 years and then gets rebuilt in the future. Is that going to affect the value of that car? I think the way things are run now with rebuilt titles, salvage titles, things like that, you're going to see a difference in value in the future of that car from a monetary standpoint, but from a historic value standpoint, I don't think that'll be any different because you're still going to be able in a museum setting or in an educational setting you're still going to be able to talk about the impact Tesla had on the automobile industry and everything that went behind that. So kind of an interesting, you know, juxtaposition there of two different worlds. 
And you bring in the, the that that fact of the collectible automobile, and so you know, I I alluded to 2017 Impala SS. It's crash today. Two-year-old car, say 22,000 miles, goes away, comes back with a rebuilt title. And what happened to the 64 Impala that was wrecked in 66 that the same thing happened? And I'm sure there was rebuilt or salvaged titles back then, or reasonably sure. Even if we go back to the 90s with rebuilt titles, and now some things are becoming collectible if, say, you had a What's collectible from the 90s? So you had a 90... uh, a 1993 Chevy Beretta GT, right? Ah, That's well, I was going to give you a little props and say, well, okay, I'm, I'm out of my 94 Corvette ZR1, and I, I crash it uh, in 96. And, it's, you know, I get my money, I go on my merry way, and I go out and you know, buy a Grand Sport and a 96 and keep my Corvette. And I'm happy. I'm a happy Corvette owner, blah, blah, blah. Don't ever care what happened to the car. Guy comes along, buys the car, rebuilds it, sells it. It's a rebuilt title in 96. At what point does that title then, now we're here, we are 20, almost 25 years later. And, you know, it almost becomes a classic car and I could put historic tags on it in certain states. Is it still a rebuilt? Is there any effect on the value? Can it be retitled as a... I just don't understand or follow the the difference in how it goes. I see it preserving history, and I see the need for it. If it would have been totaled and just shoved off, doesn't it make everybody else with a 94 ZR1? And I can't remember. Say they produced 1,700 of them in 94. Doesn't that mean now that they're six hundred and or sixteen hundred and ninety nine, those are worth just a couple dollars more, and so on as they go away? Or the fact that my car hung around does it hurt the survivorship? Uh, and we see it all. The, and I, mean, I want to say I see it all the time. You know, I see new Porsche nine eighteens wrecked. I see nine fifty nines wrecked. I see you know a new Ferrari wrecked. I see a two eighty eight GTO wrecked. Take Richard Rawlings a couple of years ago. We talked to, we've talked about him before. He took that wrecked Ferrari F40 and put it together. And I guess that one does have a uh, negative connotation because it's not selling for real F40 money. But, you know, he kind of he didn't return it to original. He kind of uh, did a Richard Rawlings gas monkey garage to it. Yeah, we don't need to talk about that car again. You know, you, you gave the, the you, you know, uh, just to, you know, get the appropriate uh, information out there, you, you you really overshot the 94 ZR1. There were 448. Hey, I I, I was being hope <laughs> or, or hoping or that you would step in a little bit quicker. Well, you know, you, know you, you, you talk and then I can't jump in. But you brought up you, actually what you just said about Richard Rawlings brings up an interesting part of this conversation. And I think even my uh mention about you know a wrecked tesla in some cases um and i talked about in my my first kind of rant on this i think we also need to consider and look at and think about the historic value of accidents and what that means for a, a you know a vehicle and i said you know significant vehicles you know, if we look back in the past, and especially in, in the collector car world and the museum world, there are certain cars that have more monetary value as well as historic value that have been in wrecks uh, of some kind, minor or major, that if they're not repaired, they are worth more. You know, I mean, I can kind of go back over time through my career and think about a couple vehicles that I've dealt with that have high historic value because of an accident they were in that they still have, you know, a mark left or a, a, a witness, you know, kind of damage that you can attribute to that wreck that adds value to the car, both, as I say, both monetary and historic, because you can prove that that damage proves what car that is. I mean, that is, that is, you know, a primary 
document of the car that it is actually the car it's it's said to be rather than some restored vehicle that people are claiming oh this is that car well you know it's been restored how do we know how do we that evidence isn't there anymore and when you think about modern cars and you start thinking about just production vehicles i mean i guess i'm always looking at it from a historic standpoint rather than a monetary standpoint You know, just in my head right now, sitting here thinking, I threw out the idea of, you know, a Tesla that's been in a wreck and then gets rebuilt 20 years later. But if we think about some of the Teslas that have made national news because of the wrecks they've been in, I'm thinking of one right off the top of my head. There was an accident in Florida. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, it was a fatal accident. But the gentleman that was driving was killed in this accident because he had the self-driving mode on a semi pulled out in front of him that the trailer was white the self-driving cameras the mode did not detect that there was an object in front of the vehicle because it was white and it couldn't pick it up so it never hit the brakes and he you know the vehicle slammed into the semi unfortunately as i say killing the the driver or the occupant at the time because the car was self-driving you know, that kind of leads to this national news story questioning Tesla, questioning the uh, validity and capability of self driving mode. That car now is involved in a historic accident that led to questions being asked, new technologies being developed. So, you know, from my standpoint, as, as a curator, as someone involved in historic vehicles, that car is worth more to me in its wrecked condition than it would be in a rebuilt condition. And there are a number of cars, if you look back over time, that are that way. I mean, think of the Bonnie and Clyde car. The whole point of that is that it still has the bullet holes in it that, you know, that it was riddled with when the police finally caught up with them. So I think there's also a question in this about when should a car not be rebuilt Versus, you know, when it it could be rebuilt and have a rebuild or salvage title nowadays. And the Bonnie and Clyde car is a perfect example. And pure coincidence, I just watched a movie on um, Bonnie and Clyde the other night in The Highwaymen. Woody Harrelson and Kevin Costner. And man, those guys look old anymore. I'd hate to see me in a mirror. Well, actually, I look pretty good in a mirror. But back on the subject, the car was... Obviously, we all know what happened to Bonnie and Clyde, and the car was perforated pretty good by six or seven hundred bullets or whatever the exact number is. What amazed me, because I I know the car, I've seen the car, and I know it's toured with the bullet holes, but the car was stolen. You know, obviously, Bonnie and Clyde, even though they did thank Henry Ford for the power of the V8, did not actually go in and properly buy and finance this car. They stole it, and after... They were apprehended and killed. The car was returned to the woman who owned the car, who it was stolen from. Unfortunately, we don't really have these anymore, but some circus sideshow guy came along really quickly and offered to buy the car off of her. Now, what's she going to do with it? Keep it? Keep this car? It's, you know, I'm sure insurance was even more difficult to deal with in the 30s than it is now. You know, and get all the bullet holes fixed and upholstery, and it's still a Bonnie and Clyde car. Or this circus promoter or this sideshow promoter bought the car and put it on traveling exhibition. And that car is remains today, and much to, you know, Derek's point, it's worth a lot. And then he brought up the Tesla, and we think it's morbid, and, you know, this happened, somebody died in it. Why would you want to preserve that car? Well, there was this guy, um, James Dean, and I think we all know what happened to Mr. Dean. And, you know, unfortunately, he was fatally killed in his Porsche 550 Spider. Uh, we won't discuss fault or not, but he was killed in it. That car was put on display and toured mostly as a educational tour, tool. It wasn't as a sideshow, you know, see the car James Dean died in. It was more, more to promote safe driving habits and being careful and, uh, you know, speeding is bad. And, you know, however you believe the story, whether it was James Dean's fault for speeding or whether somebody just happened to pull, pulled out in front of him, you know, 
to each his own on that one. But he, that, you know, that car was very historically significant. And it, it like I said, it toured. I've got photographs of it on the tour for on the California Highway Patrol or whoever was doing that. But then, the you know, the car was stolen and nobody knows where the car is. It, we know it's not restored and being shown as a 550 because the VIN number doesn't appear. Um, it's got tucked away in a warehouse somewhere or did it, did it get crushed and scrapped? But there's various cars over the years that are better in their damaged state. And I guess that's where we're going to, we've moved this conversation to is when do you make the decision to repair or to, to leave it alone? I'm trying to think of something a little bit more recent than James Dean, going to jump to, and Derek's going to be very familiar if I jump to the uh, Kennedy limousine where he he was killed in. And that, that car has been, obviously, was kept in use, fitted with a hard top and things. Am I right, Derek? Or? Yeah, so that car actually was, um, after the Kennedy assassination, was retrofitted, rebuilt, and uh, there was, a, as you say, a, a hard top permanent basically greenhouse top put on a, a full Lexan bulletproof clear top put on it that the presidents then could be seen through, uh, but not, you know, take a bullet directly to their body. So, and that was used, uh, if I recall all the way up into, I believe it was the Carter administration, uh, before it was taken out of service. The reason for that is it was cheaper to rebuild that vehicle uh, than it was to have a completely new limousine built. And that was the decision by the federal government and Secret Service to do that. So, yeah, I mean, that that is another case where it still has historic value, but that, you know, the the evidence of what happened with that car was was definitely removed uh, from that vehicle uh, in in its life. And you brought us right up to Carter, and I'm going to throw another one out there. To me, it gets a little bit more to the values and the value of historical significance. After Carter, we had Reagan, and he, while he wasn't assassinated, obviously his limousine was damaged because if our younger listeners don't know, and when Reagan was shot, he was hit by a bullet that glanced off his bulletproof car and you know caught him in the arm and entered his chest cavity, etc., and almost killed him. That car was repaired after that and utilized for many, many years. You know, presidential limousines, each president doesn't get a new one. They even, I think Trump got a new one, but that was ordered 10 years ago by Bush. You know, it just takes a long time to produce these tanks that they use. You know, I, to me, I would much rather go see the Reagan car with the bullet scuff than the Reagan car, even if it still exists. I, I, I've heard, I can't remember where the Reagan limousine is. Henry Ford Museum sitting right in front of the uh, Kennedy yeah. assassination. Car. Yeah, so <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Very familiar with both cars. Yeah, so, but they did repair it, did they not? And do you think the historical significance would be better with the bullet? marks to tell the story since obviously you were there and I, I you know i forgot that it was on display so you were probably not necessarily involved in restoring it but you've seen the car and have sat there and fantasized and formulated your opinions on that or oh yeah and actually um interestingly enough um there's there's a very good book on the attempted assassination of President Reagan called Rawhide Down. He, it, it, the reason it's called that is his nickname was his code name with the Secret Service was Rawhide. So that was the the title of the book is Rawhide Down, which is the the actual call that was sent out when they finally realized he had been shot, which was Rawhide Down, which means get to the hospital. I actually had the good fortune of being the conservation staff member who was in charge of kind of care of the automotive collections. And did an interview with the author of that book about that vehicle and uh, talked a lot about it to him and, and kind of explained what exactly happened. And as John said, yes, the the bullet actually ricocheted off of the right rear quarter panel and went through about not quite a two inch gap in the door opening between the fe- the rear quarter and the door and uh, penetrated him basically through his armpit into his lung. You know, there's a lot of 
Secret Service photographs from uh, the, the the incident and the attempted assassination, and you can clearly see where the bullet hit the car and ricocheted. You know, from a from the standpoint of presenting it as a historic vehicle that was involved in something like that, my thought is yes, it would be fantastic to still have that mark there, to still have the actual evidence of that moment happening. It's much more powerful for people to see that they actually have something tangible to look at more than the vehicle, but the actual, you know, scar and evidence that's left from such a basically, you know, pivotal moment in American history. It's, it's just so much more powerful, you know, and, and, and from a different standpoint that isn't really, you know, powerful or moving, but as I talked about earlier, from a historic value standpoint of damage, uh, Henry Ford Museum has a car known as Old 16. It, it won the 1908 uh, Vanderbilt Cup. It's a 1906 locomobile. Yeah, when it first came in to the collection, I, I wasn't there. It came in years before I was there, but I, I knew, worked for the conservator who was there when it came in. And there was a huge dent on the gas tank, big copper gas tank. And they debated whether or not it should be removed. It's an unrestored car, all this. But they were able to find a photograph from the Vanderbilt Cup race at the very beginning of the race where the tank looks almost perfect. And then partway through the race where all of a sudden there's a large dent from the gas can hitting the the tank as it was being filled once. So, you know, there's that evidence that that dent should be left. So it has been kind of left in that condition and you can still see it to this day. So, you know, there's, there's kind of both worlds, the, the Reagan car being restored. I don't think it takes any, any major significance out of the car, but it would just be that extra kind of impact that it would have if that damage was still on the car to this day. So, you know, that's, that's kind of my, what I formulated in, in my time while taking care of the car. Well, what that brings us to is the topic we used quite often at the museum I was at and I've used over the years is a snapshot in time. I've always believed in restoring, you know, this is talking about restoring, not preserving, but to restore the vehicle to the most significant point in time of its life. If it's that 94 Corvette ZR1 we talked about earlier, it was my car. I'm a middle-class guy. Big deal. I didn't do anything with it. So it gets restored to the way it left the factory, brand new. Uh, all the chalk marks, every bit of overspray, etc. on the car. The Reagan limousine, with the uh, you know damage that happened, is probably, if you were to have to restore that car, obviously it didn't, doesn't need restored. When we pick some of the stuff at the museum to store restore and a lot of stuff we did was race cars you know you picked a race and then you picked a point in time in the race and one of the cars that i did was a lotus x180r which is a glorified lotus esprit in the simplest terms lotus guys please don't get mad at me but we don't want to get into all the little idiosyncrasies of the car but it's you know this lotus x180r every photograph i have of it in multiple races over time it has two fuel doors one on each side the one on the driver's side was always askew when we restored it or when i restored it that fuel door was just as askew as it was in every other photograph one of the reasons i'm not doing what i used to (laughs) is because they didn't like that they wanted perfection i go no we we're restoring to this point in time we're restoring to this photograph and this is what you know, this is what all the sponsor decals are. This is what everything's positioned to. This is the paint chosen. All of a sudden, because this thing's slightly off, no, it should be that way. And that's the that's a belief I take. Uh, it's not the reason I left, but you compound that over a whole bunch of little things. The historical significance matters to me and the correctness. You re- and So it's always, and we always said it, no, really, even even White Post, it was restored to a, you know, a point in time or a snapshot in time. And that's kind of what Derek's alluding to is certain cars that have accidents or have something special 
that happens around them. Um, you know, there's a certain white Bronco everybody talks to talks about. That car needs to stay that way. Uh, it doesn't. If you got it and you wanted to restore it, you don't restore it to the way it was picked up by the owner. You restore it to the way it was highlighted on a, you know, whatever that was, a two-hour police chase on television. And, you know, when you restore, oh, what am I thinking? There was a point in time with diecast, and I would go to the um, uh, Formula One race in Indianapolis. I went every year that it existed in Indianapolis. And the 124 scale die casts of some of the race cars and the support races, the Ferrari Challenge cars and that. I remember one year, all of a sudden, they were being sold with the dirt. And as they finished the race, not as they started the race, but as they have finished the race, so that it had, you know, tire slag up the side and pretend little bug guts and stuff. And I'm sure it wasn't exact to the real car. It was, you know, hinting at how the cars finishes, finish the race. And that's the way it should, you know, to me, it should be preserved. Um, I know I'm kind of taking this away from the accident thing. I uh, did a Lotus 27 restoration. The car was raced in 62 and put up at the end of the end of the year. Never touched again. It went from one guy's basement to another guy's basement to my hands. And we did a preservation and kept everything exactly the way it was. We didn't really de-age it. Uh, we put new rubber on it so that the brakes functioned and that. We had to go in and do some internals on the motor. But every crack in the fiberglass, every piece of tape that was on the car... Uh, to every nut and bolt that came off the car went back into the same hole that it came out of. And I've got all the records, and I'll always argue if you ever, you know, that's how I did that restoration, so it would be correct. And I think that's the historical point in time. So do we start looking at some of these things now, too? Now that I've totally disrailed and probably destroyed Derek's thought process no no no, not at all not at all i because you know and and you know we talked obviously we started out with this on on the whole idea of rebuilt titles and and you know does that decreasing the value of modern cars and how does that not how is that not the same as as pulling a car out of a junkyard that's 50 60 70 years old and rebuilding it and you know why is that different and I think, you know, I think we're kind of coming to the conclusion that although it has a monetary impact on modern vehicles, you know, we talk about, you know, our podcast is about the collector car world and, and the hobby and everything that we do here. And I think as we talk about this, you know, we're, we're all coming, you know, John, you and I are coming to the conclusion that, you know, even though it may have a monetary effect on the car, we shouldn't look down on it, even though they're getting rebuilt titles, whatever it is, we're saving cars. We are saving automobiles and making them available for future generations. So I don't think it should be a problem. And, you know, as you were talking about that and yeah, I'm not, you know, we're not always talking about production vehicles that are out on the street that every year, your average person is driving right now, but you know, a modern vehicle that I can think of, and, and I'm going to be very short in what I say about this and, and very cautious maybe in what I, how I, how I phrase it. But, you know, a lot of people uh, remember last year when Corvette ZR1 pace car uh, pacing, uh, you know, a, a race in Detroit uh, lost control and what, you know, was wrecked. GM General Motors makes very few uh, of the actual pace cars. Uh, I think there were three of that, that ZR1 pace car built. You know, they made the decision to repair the car so it could be used in other races to pace other races. That car obviously was owned by the corporation that was repaired by the corporation. So there's, there's a story there because they needed it to race or pace other races uh, you know, from a historic standpoint, from from telling a story, 
you know, that was a, a pretty significant incident that occurred that day. You know, a lot of people witnessed it, a lot of Corvette fans, a lot of race fans from a, a historic value standpoint. That would almost be a, a great car to have in the condition it, it wound up in after the after the incident because it it tells a story. You know, there's a story there that a lot of people re- will remember in future in the future. You know, that's kind of a modern, you know, very current up to date version of something that happened. Obviously not a, a production vehicle that someone John Smith owns and is driving around, but you know, a look at something that that car still has historic value just from being a pace car and, and being the car that was involved in that incident, but it's been repaired and just looks like, you know, one of those pace cars. The the pace car that you're alluding to is a very good example, but we're talking about collector cars that get damaged, or that's where we started this. And does it have an effect on historic value and to me, a little bit of monetary value. If I'm not mistaken, you've got six cars at the museum that this took a <laughs> huge turn for the uh, history books, we'll say. That, that eight. Eight, yep. Yeah. Well, so there's two of them that we forget. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see, now that's how you're supposed to correct me. I'm not always right, just most of the time. Those cars, I think, historically might be more valuable now. And I'm not speaking money. I'm say, saying part of their story is the way they sit, uh, on restored, displayed, because they tell a story of the Corvette. They tell a story of unexpected tragedy. And they also tell a story of overcoming that tragedy. Then they tell the story of... And I think it's a wonderful that a display that the museum put together, and it was before your day, so I feel comfortable talking about it. And that it tells you tell a geological story, and explaining sinkholes and how these happen, and why somebody builds a museum on top of a sinkhole. <laughs> that that question was posed to me of uh, probably a month, month and a half ago. Why did they put the, you know, what happened? Didn't they not know it was there? You know, that little 30 seconds of history that fortunately the security cameras caught, I think made a big difference in, you know, we'll say the, the, the future of eight cars. And I think the decisions made, but... <laughs> Even if you could have restored all of those cars, I don't think restoring all of them would have been right. I think it was nice to be able to restore a few and leave a few because we're able to say, oh, see, we can do this, but the story's more important to leave these or they're, again, it's that snapshot in time and those eight cars are forever changed by that one snapshot in time and all of them echo back to that, even though they've had other snapshots in time that they were more significant, whether it was their condition or their production number or what they were. Uh, you know, I'm thinking of the the one that was a donated car that was kind of able to be saved and then the millionth Corvette and the Mallet Corvette. And that was the Mallet, right? That got damaged. Mallet. Yeah, the Mallet Hammer. Yep. But yeah, it's, I mean, it, it is a great example, something that I deal with on a, a daily basis, obviously, because they're part of the collection here. You know, and it, it does go back. I mean, there there were two cars in, involved in that incident, you know, in the sinkhole here at the museum that were your everyday production Corvettes. I mean, there was a 40th anniversary, 1993 Ruby Red, and there was a 1962 Tuxedo Black uh, Corvette, just a production 62 Corvette, uh, one owner car, same thing with the 40th anniversary that you know, went into the sinkhole. And then there were six fairly significant Corvettes that went into that sinkhole. You know, the Mallet Hammer conversion, uh, the only surviving ZR1 Spider of the two that were built, C4 generation, the one and a half millionth Corvette, the PPG pace car, uh, do, do, do. Wow. I, I, I need to, I need to count on my hands, which ones I've talked about. So the 62, the, the 94, 
93, 40th anniversary, the mallet hammer conversion, the CR1 Spider, the PPG pace car, the one and a half millionth. Then we've got the Blue Devil, ZR1 Blue Devil, and the one millionth. Was that all eight? Am I missing any of them? That's, I counted eight, so. Okay, all right. I was trying to go around the display, but, you know, and what we have is some very significant Corvettes and, and two that were, you know, not necessarily historically significant uh, in some, you know, extremely important way like the millionth or, you know, the PPG pace car, you know, things that have a, as John says, you know, a moment in time that is extremely significant. You know, the one millionth, as most people know, the millionth Corvette, the ZR1 Blue Devil, which was a pre-production prototype, and the 1962 Corvette Tuxedo Black are the three that got restored. They were the least damaged, obviously. And of course, the ZR1 Blue Devil and the millionth and the 62 are all restored to a moment in time. The millionth restored to the moment it came off the assembly line. The ZR1 Blue Devil, you know, the moment it was finished in the prototyping facility at at General Motors at the design studio. And the 62, which, you know, GM restored the millionth and the Blue Devil. We, the Corvette Museum, restored the 62. And we made the decision to restore it to basically the moment before it actually fell into the hole. You know, we still tell the story of it falling in the hole, but we represent the car and the way it looks as the story of the original owner and his life with the car. And that was the decision on the historic value of that car and where it would be. You know, as most people look at those, you know, you think, oh, gosh, you know, the they're nothing. You know, they're they're a crumbled heap of metal and fiberglass now that, you know, what 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 does it tell us? What is it? What I mean, what am I looking at? Well, yes, the car has historic value from what it was before the sinkhole, but it has that historic value of the story we now tell that John just talked about, which is, you know, this is why this happened. This is, this is the region that we live in, in Kentucky and this part of the country, which is a karst region. We tell the geological story and you get a chance. I mean, people see these sinkholes occur on TV. They hear people talk about, Oh, a sinkhole swallowed a house. You don't go see the remnants of that. It, you know, where the sinkhole occurred or anything like that. You know, this is an opportunity to show people the, de- you know, kind of what can happen in these sinkholes, how devastating it can be, the damage that can occur because of a sinkhole, uh, you know, opening up and happening. And, you know, so it's also an educational opportunity in, in that aspect as well. Uh, from a, a monetary standpoint, obviously, as the museum, we don't ever talk about that. We don't get involved in talking about that as a nonprofit. But John, I'm sure you would have thoughts on a nationally, internationally significant event like that could do to the value, monetary value of a a vehicle that, you know, had that type of notoriety. I'm not going to comment on that. Um, We'll let the listeners make that decision. Um, Maybe we'll put a picture up on uh, Facebook and you guys can comment back and say, hey, what do you think this did to to these Corvettes? And because... I think in this whole episode, and I don't know how we got there, that really speaks to, you know, we have three that were restored and put back together. We have five that weren't the same historical incident. Which car would you, you know, not, not, oh, I'd like to have the Blue Devil or I'd like to have the Mallet because of what it was. Which would you prefer to have? One that came out of the cult? the hole and is not restored, you know, tell us, you know, what you think about it. Um, I'll definitely get those, you know, a picture up and, you know, something of the, of what happened. But I think that's probably the ideal uh, thing because we're talking vintage cars. We're talking modern cars. We're talking, you know, it's, it's history. And um, everybody knows uh, I, I spent many years in museums and working with museum artifacts and, History has been important to me. You know, my mom's got a degree in, you know, history. It's something that's been in my family, so it sticks there. You know, obviously, I worked for a for-profit shop before my nonprofit days and museum days. And Zara, you can laugh at that point, too. She still laughs about me working for a 
the nonprofit I did up to now where now that I'm self-employed, it's again, all about generating revenue and making money, but it's still wanting to find, to respect the owner's wishes and put these cars in the right homes. Uh, when I, when I'm being asked what part of what I do now is to help, um, we'll say place cars. I don't broker, I don't do anything, but I help some cars find homes. So part of that is I, I kind of think of where does this need to be? And I think that's still part of that little museum portion. And I hope never to lose that. It's going to cost me some money over the years, but, and I'm sure I, you know, I could make more money if I would sell something to somebody. Yeah. Well, and I think, you know, John, I think, you know, talking about, you know, this, we got a little sidetracked and it's probably my fault. Um, but, you know, just going back to what I said a little bit ago, you know, going back to our original discussion with changing the value of a car, if it's rebuilt and looking at, at, you know, doing the same thing with antique and classic vehicles. And it doesn't, I, I mean, it makes them worth more when you restore them. Like you said, I really think what it comes down to is I never look I, I, and, you know, it's odd because the way I grew up, I was the son of a, a GM body technician, obviously, and a, a man who restores cars to this day. And, you know, from that that world, from the, the, the body tech world, a rebuilt title on a car was, you know, you, you uh, don't go near it. You know, you don't want to do that. You know, it's it's just you don't want to get involved with that. My 93 Beretta, we rebuilt from pretty much a total and, and I drove that around. <laughs> Uh, you know, and it was a great car. I think we do need to change the thought process on those rebuilt titles. Now, I'm not saying that you don't need to be careful because you have to be very cautious in knowing that the car was rebuilt correctly, that the proper repairs were made so that the car is still safe. Because if they're not rebuilt correctly, especially modern vehicles, there are a lot of safety issues that can can happen uh, with that. You know, you could be driving that car around and get in a wreck. Some of the safety features of that car could fail because it was not repaired correctly. So I'm not saying you don't need to be cautious when looking at purchasing a rebuilt salvage title vehicle, whatever it, it's called, wherever you live and whatever you're looking at. But I don't think they need to be looked down upon because it is – as you and I, John, I think have come to the conclusion and agree on, it is just another way of restoring a car and keeping it on the road. And eventually that car will likely become a classic car or an antique car. And it's saving that car from, you know, certain death, you know, from being crushed, crumpled and recycled. And in 50, 100 years, somebody's going to appreciate that that car was saved in the way it was. Now, is that going to affect the value of cars in the future as collectors? Because there's going to be more of them in existence still, maybe, but we'll have to wait 50 to 100 years to find that out, um, which I hope to be around in about 50 years, but I'm definitely not going to be here in 100. I, I can guarantee you that unless there's some modern medical miracle that happens. If we want to bring it back to the collector car hobby and get away from that whole historic thing we talked about and, and everything we kind of went off on a tangent on. I really hope that some people can start not necessarily just thinking automatically that a rebuild or a salvage title is a bad thing. Yes, you need to pay attention to what you're purchasing uh, and, and know that it's safe, but I hope we can start looking at it as though, you know, maybe these cars are being saved for the future to be classic and antique vehicles someday in the future. I think that's probably a pretty good way to close it. I'm not going to babble on and destroy the perfect ending. With that, good night, everybody. We'll talk to you in a week. See you guys later. <laughs>